are Dr. Rita Pratap, former head of the department drawing and painting, University of Rajasthan, Jaipur. I am going to speak on the history of Japanese painting. Module 35, Modern Japan, 1868 to the present. With the Meiji Restoration in 1867, the Japanese made westernization and modernization their goals. Japanese students studied in the West and foreigners established universities and colleges in Japan. Kiyoroda became the first Japanese professor of Western style painting at the Tokyo School of Fine Arts. Oka Kura Tenshin became director of the Tokyo School of Fine Arts, the most dynamic and original master who brought Japan's new print movement to international renown was Munakata Shiko. The rise in nationalism has, however, produced signs of a changing attitude and a growing awareness that Japan's own traditions are vital and valid. The younger artists, many of whom have lived abroad, have developed a new perspective and make objective use of indigenous as well as foreign traditions. May it be architecture, printmaking, calligraphy, ceramic or pottery. By the middle of the 19th century, the conservative and isolationist policies of the Tokugawa Bakufu had been rendered untenable by several forces. The Confucian notion that the emperor son of heaven was the only legitimate source of rule. The presence of western gunboats demanding trade relations and a growing feeling among the intelligentsia that Japan was socially, politically and military backward among the world's nations. With the Meiji Restoration in 1867, the Japanese made westernization and modernization their goals. The cultural experience of the Meiji, Taisho and Showa eras included a massive ingestion of European and American learning. Japanese students studied in the West and foreigners established universities and colleges in Japan. The young Meiji emperor and empress were photographed in Western dress, architecture and British Victorian grandeur. Western oil paintings was called yoga and the students in Europe for long periods were able to effect Japanization of its themes and techniques far more rapidly than in the Tokugawa period when foreign travel was banned. A good example of this is Kuroda Siki, 1866-1924, whose 1987 yoga painting, which is oil on canvas, Lake Shore Western style painting, shows a woman resting by a lake after bath. The painting Lake Shore is a Western style painting showing a woman resting by a lake after bathing. Kuroda studied paintings for nine years in Paris before returning to Japan in 1893 to open his own school. He later became the first Japanese professor of Western style painting at the Tokyo School of Fine Arts. Lake Shore is an ingenious fusion of late 19th century fresh styles with the courtesan prints popular in Japan for over a century. But here the woman is emancipated and Anhui is replaced by intelligence. Another Meiji effort at mirror parity 
was to ape the West in having only one religion. To this end, Shinto was disentangled from foreign Buddhism. Buddhist monasteries and art treasures were systematically destroyed and had it not been for the timely appointment of Dr. Ernest Fanalosa, a professor of philosophy at the Imperial University of Tokyo and the arrival of his wealthy Boston friend William Bagelow, much more would have been lost. Together, they purchased the huge collection of ancient Japanese Buddhist art, which forms the core of the Asian collections in Boston Museum of Fine Arts. More important for Japan, perhaps, was Fenelosa's advice to the Japanese government that ingenious artistic traditions should be preserved and practiced. For at the time, all branches of studies, from oil painting to industrial design, were of Western origin. The modified traditional Japanese painting style promoted by Fanalosa was called Nihonga to be distinguished from Western style oil painting yoga. He maintained that powerful expressive Japanese line was essential but that it should be reinforced with more realistic Western chiaroscuro and a brighter range of colors. By 1891, when Fenelosa left Japan to become director of the Oriental Art Department of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, the survival of Nihonga paintings in Japan was assured. His brilliant disciple, the philosopher Okakura Tenshin, 1862-1913, became director of the Tokyo School of Fine Arts. In contrast to Fenerosa's stress on the bold Kano school line, Oka Kura promoted a delicately expressive line derived from Yamatoe. Oka Kura often wrote and lectured in English on Japanese aesthetics and was an instrumental in promoting Japanese art abroad as he was in retaining native traditions at home. Japanese influences and styles in Nihonga painting include pure ink landscapes, color wash styles, and thick impasto screens with colored designs on gold. Although originally painted on screens or in hanging scrolls format, Nihonga works today are usually framed in western style since mineral pigments are easily damaged by repeated rolling and unrolling. Themes include standard eastern figures and landscape compositions as well as western motifs and mere abstract designs. The mode is unified by materials, writing brush and ink or mineral pigment on silk or paper. Among the major artists at the turn of the century was the short-lived Hishida Shinsho, 1874 to 1910. A student of Okakura Tenshin, he studied in Tokyo and later taught at Tenshin's Japan Institute of Fine Arts. His style was a new departure for that time, using no overt line work and was condemned by critics as being muddled or incompetent. In Fallen Leaves, in his double six-fold screen, Fallen Leaves, here Shinsho combines Western realism with the poetry of space. Trees seem to recede into an all-pervading mist, losing definition. There is a reference to Tohaku's magnificent pine forest, but the statement is otherwise in the language of Western realism. The giants of no typical presentative Nihonga are two old friends who toured Europe together in the 20s and visited China several times. Kobayashi Koke and Maeda Seishan.
Koke encloses his forms with fine taunt lines which seem to have a life of their own. Often a subtle reverse shading from light to dark progresses from outline to center of each form as if hues started by the line have withdrawn in haste. Similarly, the delicate shading enveloping his motifs functions like the emotive cloud and blush or breathe or both. A famed New York critic confessed he found Nihonga lifeless and dull and wondered why the Japanese love it so. This is because he was waiting for the work to arouse him. Instead, he should have entered the painting quietly and respectively. Then the dramatic tension of Koki's fruit which electrifies the still life and charges the air, the subtle depiction of the fruit's color, the quivering emotive space would have transported him to the world of Japanese sensibilities which have quickened screens and scrolls for over a thousand years. Most halls in the Gosha Imperial Palace in Tokyo display a single Nihonga work, Seishon's magnificent lion dancer awaiting Q, 1955, enlivens the enclosing space with typical taunt. Seishon's work are usually high restrained, holding a reserve formidable energies. As in Ona A painting, he explores the world of inner emotional turbulence beneath surface calm. The difference is that Sheshon's subjects are not victims of affairs of the heart, but often warriors before battle, medical students at the anatomy lesson, and autopsy, woman at bath, etc. In the manner of the frolicking animal scroll, Sheshan once painted a long ink monochrome hand scroll of a monkey's journey to the West. He explored all major traditions, bringing a new life to each. In 1930, he even rivaled the sumptuous Koran, challenging his iris screen with a stupendous double six fold screen with a stupendous double six-fold screen of red and white poppies on a gold ground. Impasto flowers of the same height range across both screens in one daring continuous horizontal band against a flat gold ground. White poppies in full bloom on the right screen and red poppies still in firm bud along the left screen. The relentless continuum is dramatically broken towards the end of the left screen where the field flowers have been trampled down, revealing a curved depression, relieving the greens of the entire panel. One and a half full blooms in an outrageous reds. In the Nihonga paintings of Fukuda Hei Chechiro, 1892 to 1972, and Tokuka Shenshen done in traditional pigments on silk and paper. The forms are rendered in a near abstract manner like that common in non-Japanese abstract painting. Fukuda's Virgin Snow of 1948 is an evocative portrait of white snow softness in a garden setting where six stepping stones are shaded in various hues. One of the greatest Nihonga artists is Higa Shiyama Kai, born in 1908, whose intellectual approach brings a new dimension to this style of painting. Many of his works exploit single motif in single colors. The mineral pigment 
is burned periodically to darken its hue as the work progresses. When in 1977 his murals for the Tosho Daijin in Nara were the subject of a major exhibition in Paris, the whole room was reproduced to scale in order to show the scale and function of his panels. They were to adorn the space in which the now street image of Genjin is kept. The exhibition demonstrated how the arts of the Japanese present relate intimately and harmoniously to those of the past. Nihonga in the 70s, however, began to turn more towards the Viennese school of fantasy. Today's works are often treated as if painted in oils in a congested manner and with high color contrast. The movement is in danger of losing its once unique potential. Because of its unassertive qualities, Nihonga paintings like Kana calligraphy has not received the attention it deserves from the West. The print movement, however, in spite of the indifference of a government anxious to foster a Western image through conceptual art, steel and laser sculpture, etc., has gone from strength to strength. In the Taisho era, that is from 1912 to 1926, artists began to design, carve and pull their own prints in a creative print movement, Sosaku Hanga. Studies in black, such as black figures walking on rainy nights, reveal particularly ingenuity. Kawase Hasui, 1883 to 1957, produced landscapes where Japanese scenery is reviewed in the light of new Western realism and dramatic coloration. By contrast, Yoshida Hiroshi, 1876 to 1950, portrayed a world of pastel sentimentality echoing that of his Western counterpart, J. Walter Phillips. The most dynamic and original master who brought Japan's new print movement to international renown was Munakata Shiko, 1905 to 1977. His irrepressible energy and joy de verve were translated into vigorous, unprecedented forms. To the end of his life, he worked only with woodcut. Kasen N. Woodcut print. 1939, Honolulu, and in the collection of James A. Michener, is a print by him. Even through most of his contemporaries, even through most of his contemporaries had switched over to the more fashionable styles of mixed media print, like Inku and Hakuin. Munakata was an anomaly in his own time. The creator of a torrent of frenzied works of alarming intensity and impulse. Watching him work one formed the impression that the print possessed him rather than the other way round. His primitive lack of inhibition earned him the derisive or admiring nickname Jomon Man. Japanese artists today form a major force in the world art and many work in international circles. An avant grade image despite vigorous promotion by the establishment, lacks a genuine basis and remains an odd phenomenon with Japan. The other arts, however, rooted in long traditional, fairly burst with vitality, 
the architect Tange Kenzo, born in 1913, whose revolutionary stadium and surrounding village for the 1964 Olympics animates all the space around designs all manner of buildings in many countries. Japanese architecture in both its traditional and its contemporary form has made substantial contributions to modern concepts of modular construction and the interrelation of outdoor and indoor space. Simple lines, diffused lightning and warm textures, standard attributes of Japanese building for centuries are now commonplace throughout the world. Although Japanese sculpture lagged in the doldrums since the 4th 10th century, the 20th century has already offered the world with two great masters. Noguchi Isamau, born in 1904, and more recently Nagare Masayuki, born 1923. Both explore the contrast of rough stone finishes, varehada, and highly polished surfaces. An example is a flight sculpture by Nagare Masayuki made of 400 tons of Swedish granite from Manhattan Trade Towers, 1970. Nagare, whose works have never been false to their Japanese roots, has been largely ignored by the establishment at home for fear of promoting antiquated standards. In spite of his growing prestige abroad, like many Japanese artists of vision, he has suffered from the post-war frenzy to create an international face for Japan in commerce, shipbuilding and GNP as well as in the arts. And the resulting imposition of a rather self-conscious Western standard on Japanese artists. Whether they have lived abroad or not, artists are nowadays encouraged to emulate the latest innovation seen in foreign art journals and immediately published in local monthlies. Contemporary art in Japan has become a political commodity and its managers are usually ignorant of Japan's own distinguished history and contributions. Professor Ie Naga Saburo describing a similar situation in 8th century Nara, where most art mirrored the Chinese, observed though it was possible to import material things, it was impossible to import the social basis for the creation. Consequently, continental influences extended only to such matters as exterior ornamentations. They failed to generate a profound change in the ways of thinking and living. To a large extent, this had also been true for most of the 20th century. To a large extent, this had also been true for most of the 20th century. Whenever there have been self-doubts, Japan has held up its defensive mirror to the world and displayed art forms whose genesis lay outside Japan's own socio-cultural sphere. The recent rise in nationalism has however produced signs of a changing attitude and growing awareness that Japan's own traditions are vital and valid. The younger artists, many of whom have lived abroad have developed a new perspective and make objective use of indigenous as well as foreign traditions. For example, 
many Japanese printmakers from William Hyatt's Atelier 17 in Paris have returned to Japan and now contribute many of the finest works in print exhibitions. The oldest art industry of all, pottery continues to produce exciting work. Anonymous potters from regional folk clins sell at folk art counters in department stores. Potters like Yagi Kazuo 1919-1979 have introduced an urbane witticism to Japanese ceramics. His oeuvre is strikingly varied, ranging from glass and bronze to white and black pottery. An example quoted is letter by Yagi Kazu, Black Pottery, 1964. The art of calligraphy in a country which boasts one of the world's highest rates of literacy has a large and active group of practitioners. Ura Urato Periru Haru B. Ni Calligraphy in Oned, now called Kana Style by Khan Makiko, 1997. Annual exhibitions include calligraphy in Chinese style, Japanese style, avant grade style. Henry Round by Morita Shiryu avant grade calligraphy, ink on paper, 1967, and literary style, where instead of a single or few words, entire poems or passages are inked. Avant great stylists have broken the legibility barrier and produce pyrotechnics in ink or lacquer on silk, paper or board. Calligraphy appears on book titles, magazine covers, film titles, names on building, handbag claps, textiles, bar signs and napkins. There is hardly an aspect of contemporary Japanese life untouched by the well-turned calligraphy, be it in Chinese character, the fluid hiragana or the angular katakana often used for foreign sounds. Although the average Japanese today is schooled to distinguish fine art placed on museum pedestals from applied art in clothing, houses, pottery, garden design or trains, he is nevertheless as susceptible to the beauty or to the sadness of things as ever. For to him, all things in nature are potentially beautiful and if they are made by man, ought to be for the Japanese as for peoples of few other nations, this quality of beauty which touches them and its expression in art is an inseparable part of life itself. Thank you.